Thanks. Hey, thank you. Um, so, uh, yeah, my name's Kurt McIntyre. I'm a co-founder at Vector Digital. We make um, iPhone and Android apps, but our specialties are kind of um, iOS apps, and now iBeacon technology. We're trying to be at kind of the forefront of iBeacon. So uh, how many of you in here are iOS and Android? You guys do both things? Okay, and then how many of you just do iOS? Okay, so kind of a good mix. I don't do too much Android personally, but I'm more on the iOS side of things. I've been coming to this group for uh, probably six to eight months now, and it's been a fantastic tool for me to become a better developer and just kind of get plugged into the network here. So as you know, I'm gonna be talking about iBeacon today. Uh, how many of you have heard of this technology? iBeacon. It seems to be everywhere in the news. Um, how many of you have actually built something, have kind of like dug into the code and played around with it? Cool, cool. So in today's talk, I'm going to um, try to kind of talk about the what iBeacons are, but more than that, I want to show the people who are really interested in kind of getting into the nitty gritty, like how you would actually build an app that utilizes iBeacon. So uh, if you guys want to follow me on Twitter, follow my company on Twitter, or use the hashtag iBeacon, that'd be great. There aren't too many people out there doing iBeacon right now. So anything you can do to kind of get plugged in and at the cutting edge of this technology, it'll be a big help for you and your clients. So let me just kind of introduce kind of a scenario to you. Um, so let's say that you're going into Best Buy and you're going to buy a new TV. You want a big flat screen TV. And you're, God forbid, going into the store for the first time <laughs> um, in like a year or whatever. So you're walking into Best Buy. And as soon as you walk in, you have the Best Buy app. And you get this message on your phone. It says, hey, welcome to Best Buy. Uh, we, have, um, we have a couple of different specials for people who um, are our mobile customers today. So feel free to check them out. So you walk back to the TV aisle, and you're looking at TVs. And you know, normally when you're online, you can you know, compare multiple TVs. You can look at all their specs. You can see reviews. And online, it's a really great shopping experience. In person, though, you get to touch the actual TV. You get to feel it. Um, and there's something really special about the in-store experience, too. But um, for the first time with iBeacon, you're kind of able to merge the two. So, Imagine pulling up that app again, and underneath each television is an iBeacon. And when you get close enough to one of those products, pull up your phone, and it says, you know, hey, you can view the specs, you can view the ratings, all those things that you'd be able to view online. But with the iBeacon, it just kind of pops up to the top of your screen. So I'm going to distribute a couple of iBeacons around the room so you guys can kind of touch and feel these things. Here, feel free to pass it around. There you go. So these ones are called Estimo Beacons. Uh, that's kind of one of the companies that makes them. So imagine one of these beacon things kind of underneath every TV at a Best Buy. You know, they could put it in different departments or buy different products. And whenever your phone gets near it, different actions can happen. So let's say that you're, you know, you're kind of wishy-washy, you're not sure which TV you want. So you're sitting there and you're looking at specs and you're thinking about it. Well, all of a sudden, after a few minutes, Best Buy pushes you a message that says, hey, you know, we're offering, you know, five, ten percent off this TV today. And they waited to send you that coupon, but they noticed that since you were hanging out at that TV for about three minutes, you were in proximity of that beacon they could kind of feel that you were kind of going back and forth on this decision. So they know that you're interested, but they really want to seal that deal. So they're able to send you a, a kind of a message with a coupon in it. So I think that this kind of really illustrates what the potential of iBeacon is in a retail setting, but it's so much more than that. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about you know, what is iBeacon. I'm going to touch a little bit on Bluetooth low energy. Um, I'm also going to show you how to detect iBeacons in your apps 
And then this next part's really cool. You can actually turn one of your iOS devices into an iBeacon. And I'll, I'll show you guys how to do that. And then I'll go over some different real world applications as well as an application that we kind of um, hacked together at Vector Digital. And I'll kind of walk you through what kind of that real life uh, programming architecture scenario would look like. So feel free to interrupt me throughout this talk. Anytime if I'm saying something that doesn't make sense or I'm saying something that's wrong, just raise your hand and let me know. So uh, what is Bluetooth low energy? We all have Bluetooth devices, and so like your mouse, your wireless mouse, a um, bunch of different devices have Bluetooth. But what Bluetooth low energy is, is it's kind of a new way, it's a new protocol or standard for devices to send very, very small packets of data um, to smartphones and other devices that intercept those Bluetooth signals. Uh, the really cool things about this is it's really optimized for battery life. So you can all of a sudden use Bluetooth technology in places that you really couldn't have used them before. And it just opens up a world of possibilities. So some of those possibilities, um, those of you who follow uh, CES every year, uh, this year, there's been a whole new release of all sorts of different like wearables, wearable devices that you can wear on your body that can interact with your smartphone. And a lot of them use Bluetooth low energy to do that communication. But for this talk, I'm going to be talking more about iBeacons, not iBacon here. Um, but I'm going to be talking about iBeacons. So what happens if you have a Bluetooth low energy device and all it does is just basically, it's just put on a little coin battery, and it just sits there and it basically says, hey, I'm here. That's it. That's all it sends for data. It's not transferring you know, big packets of information. It's just saying, hey, I'm right here. So what could you do with that? Uh, so I don't know where those beacons are. Feel free to keep on passing them around. But if you ripped one of those open, basically they have like a little circuit board inside of them and they have kind of like a small coin battery inside of them. And basically they're just perfectly optimized for saying, hey, I'm here, and telling smartphones that. So these kind of beacon things, um, they, they send out very small packets of data. And this is where, gonna, where we're gonna get a little bit technical. Some of the, th the most important things that they send are these three things. The first thing is called a UUID, which is kind of a unique identifier. identifier. And it's kind of like a social security number or something. It's just a big, long string of numbers. Um, the second one is, um, it's called like a minor and a major. And basically combined, these provide a very unique number for each beacon. Uh, so not only can they say, hey, I'm here, they can say, hey, I'm here and I'm of this type. I have this number set. So as a developer, you can read that, that number and you can cause triggers inside of your apps. So you can trigger different events. There are about a million different manufacturers that are trying to hop on the iBeacon bandwagon right now. I'd say that the, the media darling is Estimote. And they make this one right here, this geometric looking one, the ones that I handed out around the room. And, but there are lots of others too. There's, I know Qualcomm's making one. Uh, there's a company called Punch Through that I was introduced to. And then, um, I forget the name of this one, but, oh, Roximity. But basically, there are all sorts of companies making different iBeacons. And there are more and more people publishing different um, kind of Arduino kits online. And basically, you can spend, you know, 50, 100 bucks, and you can make your own iBeacon. Uh, it's definitely way cheaper to buy it from someone else. Um, yeah, they just are able to optimize it in China and get it down to you know, virtually nothing. So we see iBeacon costs. What I'm seeing is you know, basically nothing if you buy it at volume, all the way up to about $99 for some of the DIY kits. Uh, the battery life, it kind of ranges. Um, some companies claim a battery life of like two years, whereas other companies claim something more like two months. And since this technology hasn't been on the market for too long, 
a lot of people aren't quite sure if that two years is absolutely correct. Um, you know, in the real world, if there was a beacon underneath, a, underneath of a TV at Best Buy, would that thing really last two years? We're not sure yet. So, like I said, the beacon kind of works. It just kind of sits there and says, hey, find me. When your phone gets within a certain distance of it, you can trigger events inside of your, your app. In addition, you can make your device act as an eye beacon too. And you can get into all sorts of interesting situations where if your phone gets in within proximity of another person's phone, uh, you can trigger something, which opens up the door for all sorts of really cool game ideas. I think the cool thing about iBeacon technology and Bluetooth low energy is over 250 million smartphone devices and tablets are already using Bluetooth inside of them right now. So it's not like this is a technology that's only available to a very small percentage of smartphone users. Um, when you're writing apps tomorrow for iBeacon, you'll have a very wide audience. So there are a couple of things that you need to know if you're gonna make an app for iBeacon. You need to know that um, the user first needs your app. You know, they have to have your app downloaded on their phone before uh, they can interact with your beacons. Another thing is that app needs to be on. It doesn't need to be the app that's at the front of your screen. It just needs to be on. So in iOS 7, they introduced the thing where you can double tap the home, the home button and you can see all the apps that are running. Well, as long as your app, your iBeacon app, is one of those apps that's running in that list, you're good. You can interact with beacons. Uh, your user needs to have their Bluetooth on. Personally, I don't care, so I just have my Bluetooth on all the time. I know other people are more conscious about their battery life. That's something that you need to get over. Um, and then from then on, um, it's kind of best practice to let people know that you're gonna be pushing messages to them. So uh, the best thing to do is to ask them when they download their app, hey, we're gonna push messages to you. Is that okay or not? So the, the user has to say that's okay. As with any technology that's you know, really powerful like iBeacons, you have the potential to really like jump out and be in somebody's pocket. And that's really powerful. But you need to be careful and you need to kind of apply best practices. So there's some good advice on this. Um, not that Uncle Ben, this Uncle Ben from Spider-Man. Um, with great power comes great responsibility. So Uncle Ben says, uh, don't spam the shit out of people. Um, don't send repeat messages. And then, you know, ultimately, more than anything, provide value. If you're going to be pushing messages into somebody's smartphone, provide value, and they'll respect it. So now we're going to kind of get into the code part of the talk. And I'm going to show you how to detect beacons inside of your apps. So feel free to slow me down here if I'm if I'm blazing through. But okay, so if you're yeah. I don't know if this is the appropriate time. I can wait till the end. But I was thinking about the, the idea of your app not being on, ways to get around that. So you know if you're if you have like scramble with friends, they'll tell you if one of your friends wants to play a game, and that app isn't running. That's SMS, right? And when you acknowledge that, it opens the app. Uh, I can't speak directly to that one. Uh, so if the app is entirely off, it's still sending you a push message yeah. or some sort of notification? I believe so. OK, well, for the iBeacon interaction to work, you do need that app at the forefront. Now, there might be other ways to send push notifications or text messages to somebody that's going outside of their traditional channels that iBeacon provides. But for pure, purely for iBeacon, you need to have that app running. Okay. I don't know. I think that a lot of people are like me. I have like 50 apps running at the same time because I don't notice any slowdown of my phone at all. You know, I can just have a bunch of apps running and in the background and it doesn't slow me down. So I'm assuming a lot of people are the same way, that they're not you know, turning off all their apps uh, when they're in the background. So um, OK, so you start your project. To detect iBeacons, you need to import the core location framework. 
and any class that you're using to interact with iBeacons, you need to make sure that it um, conforms to the CL Location Manager delegate. So that's kind of the first thing you need to do. Um, second, you need to set up a region. And a region is basically just like, okay, so here's a point in space, and if a smartphone or a user of your app enters within a certain radius of that point in space, you can trigger something. So we're setting up that, that point in space and we're setting up this radius. That's what you gotta do for a second. And you do that, you create something called a CL beacon region, and this is a subclass of CL region. Um, earlier in iOS, earlier iOS versions, you can actually set up like a, a region inside your app and when you cross that boundary via Wi-Fi and GPS, you can trigger an event inside your app. So this is just that same idea, but it's with a beacon. Once you get within a certain distance of a beacon, you can trigger something. So you're setting up the region. You can initialize that. You gotta pass in some values to initialize that region. You need to pass in what is the UUID, what is that unique ID of that beacon, as well as its major and minor values. So just more numbers that tell you what that beacon is. Instead, you could also just set it up just with the UUID. So here's what you know, setting up a region with just a UUID looks like. So I'd set up kind of a constant, and there's that big, long UUID. And then you set an identifier for that region, and it's just a way for you to keep track of what's the name of that region. That UUID is you know, just a big mess of numbers. What's just kind of like a common tongue way of you referring to that region? Well, I'm gonna say, oh, this is my Estimote Beacon region. From there, um, there's something called the CL Location Manager, and this manager is what kind of keeps track of how your device is looking for beacons. Your device can look for beacons in two different ways. First way is monitoring, and the second way is ranging. And the CL Location Manager kind of handles both of those and keeps track of that. So we'll talk about the monitoring first. So monitoring is basically like Am I inside the region? Am I inside of this radius or not? It's just kind of like a yes or no thing. So when your device is running and it's monitoring, it's just saying, okay, am I inside of the region or not? That's it. This works uh, when your phone is asleep. So let's say that you just hit the, the bumper on top and you make the screen go blank. Your phone is still monitoring to see if it's inside of that region or not. So the main method inside of this is um, did determine state for region. So you could say, okay, well if your app or your phone is state inside the region, you can do something. And if it's outside, you could do something. So this is kind of like if you wanted to run long going activities or methods, you would put them in something like this. So okay, now that you're inside of Best Buy, now do what? What would we do now? Or if they're outside, do something else. Uh, there are a couple others that pair up with monitoring. There's one that's called did enter region, and then there's another one called did exit region. So let's say that you just wanted to call something once, only when somebody is entering the region, or only when they're exiting. So this is a good time for you to say, Say, okay, well, they did enter region. Okay, send a UI notification. Hey, welcome to Best Buy. 10% off today. And then for did exit region, you could say, hey, uh, thanks for visiting today. We really enjoyed seeing you. So I've been kind of playing around with different beacons and um, building different apps. And for monitoring, I, I kind of did some tests. And what I found is if my app is open, and it's like the only app that's like I have on my main screen right now. I'm running that app. If I enter a region, I generally can detect one of those Estimote beacons within 50 feet. 
Now if it's asleep, so you know the screen, I hit the bumper and the screen's off, and I'm just walking with it in my pocket, at about 15 feet of that beacon, then I'll get the message. So um, just something to take note of. And these distances will be different for different beacons. Some beacons give off kind of a stronger signal than others. And I kind of have a hunch that battery life would affect that as well. So if you have a brand new beacon, it could potentially, your device could detect it earlier than if it was you know, about to die. So the second way that your device can detect beacons is something called ranging. And I think this is the really cool one that everybody thinks about. And this is, this is something that basically runs once a second. And your device says, OK, well, I'm looking for beacons once a second. And then as it detects beacons, it figures out how far away they are. So I mean, that's the really cool part. So not only am I in Best Buy, but I'm you know, five, 10 feet away from this TV at Best Buy. I mean, that's the really cool part. Uh, this, this ranging uh, tool or action, it only works when your app is active. So basically, you use monitoring to get somebody to open your app, and you use ranging to do kind of fine-grained actions once the app's already open. So somebody has their app in their pocket at Best Buy, you know, it buzzes or it beeps and it says, hey, you know, welcome to you know, the computer section, the computer department. You open it up and then it'll start ranging and it'll say, okay, well, you know, you can trigger any sort of events. Well, you're really close to the Apple computers, to the Macs, or you're really close to the Windows computers. So here are the different important methods for ranging. So it's called did range beacons. And like I said, this runs once every second. And you can see here there's an NS array, and you're passing in the beacon region that you set up earlier. So basically, the, the way this array works is the app scans for beacons, and the closest beacon is the first one in the array, and the furthest one is the last object in the array. So what I like to do is um, sometimes I want to massage the, the raw data that's coming in from that method. So I tend to take that NS array and I throw it into another array called detected beacons. And then I set up something called the closest beacon. So maybe I don't care that there are six beacons in the area. I just care about that one that's the most, that's the closest. So I set up one that I call closest beacon. And the way I grab that from the array is I say, you know, it's the first object in the detected beacons array because it's the closest beacon. Out of the box, Apple provides, in this API, they provide some kind of different, kind of like uh, English common ways of referring to how far a beacon is from you. So it can kind of fall into the far, near, or immediate category. And they don't really give you a distance, it's like what is immediate, what is near, and what is far. It all depends on your beacon, and it depends on um, any interference that might be in the room and stuff. But, so these are kind of the out-of-the-box um, different distance methods that you get, or distance uh, kind of variables you get. So if you look at the raw data that's coming in from did range beacons, it looks a lot like this. It basically says, okay, well, at this time stamp, this date and time, here's my beacon with this ID, major and minor. Okay, its proximity is two plus or minus 1.2 meters. And then it has an RSSI of negative 73. It's like, well, what does that mean? Let's pull away all the kind of extra junk. So what it says is, I detected three beacons. This one was a proximity of, these are the different values. This is how far they are away. And these are the signal strengths that we're getting. And then Apple kind of, in did range for beacons, it kind of decides between the, the proximity and the RSSI which beacon is closest. And I'm not entirely sure how it does that. Please tell me if you know how. Um, I've really been digging through the documentation and anytime you have new technology, there's always kind of undocumented uh, parts of it. 
And this is one of those kind of those brick walls that I ran into. It looks like they use a combination of the two because you can see here this RSSI, as it's smaller, that indicates that it, the beacon is closer. We can see here this third one, it actually has a lower RSSI than the second beacon. So it's like, well, they must be using a combination of proximity and RSSI. My best guess. So once you know what your beacon is and how far away it is, you can do something about it. Let's, let's make an action inside of your app. So let's say that the proximity is immediate. Okay, well, let's make the background of this app red. If it's near, let's make it yellow. And if it's far away, let's make it blue. So any questions on detecting beacons? About to move on to the next part. Cool. So let's say that you want to make your app a beacon. Uh, this is really similar. Um, it's, just, it's just a little bit different. So you have to import a different framework. You have to import the core Bluetooth framework for your device to actually output a beacon signal. And it needs, whatever class you're using needs to conform to CB Peripheral Manager Delegate. It's big, long nonsense. So you need to set up a peripheral manager, which manages how your device outputs this data. And you need to pass in a dictionary that's basically the packet of data that you're sending out, that you're letting the world know about. Again, you set up a region. You say, hey, my app is the region now. As I move around, this is a moving region. The cool thing is you get to set your own unique identifier and major and minor values. So you can send whatever ID you want to tell the world. So there are a couple of methods that you need to know about. Um, you basically start advertising and stop advertising. It's pretty simple there. Saying, hey, I'm sending my signals out, or no, I'm turning them off. And there's another required method um, as part of this, and it's called um, manager did update state. And basically what this one does is it's just continually listening inside of your class to see if your app is advertising a beacon signal or not. That's all it's doing. So uh, if you wanted to dig a little bit deeper into this, I'm going to show some applications next. But before we move on to that, just from the coding st standpoint of things, um, I really recommend a blog on beacon.net. I go on there like every single day. The guy's just pumping out content like crazy. And he's really at the cutting edge of iBeacon technology. Ray Wenderlich is just kind of the steadfast tool for iOS developers. They're always putting out great tutorials. And they have a couple of really great tutorials on the Bluetooth LE side of things. So if you wanted to figure out how to make your app talk with a piece of wearable technology or a heart rate monitor or something. There are some really good tutorials there. In addition, um, I don't know if any of you have internet access right now, but on GitHub there's a project that's called High Beacons, and it's a public repository. You can clone that thing to your machine right now, and it's a really good app that shows how you can detect beacons and how you can advertise for beacons. I really recommend looking at the code for that one. And I'm going to be using this app in one of our demos in just a few seconds here. Oh, and in addition, if you're interested about some of the, the stuff where I was talking about um, RSSI and proximity, that data, uh, go to this Radius Networks blog. They have some really good posts. Basically, the guy builds apps, and he tries to, like, break the iOS beacon code. And, you know, he tries to push it to its limits, and then he documents the results. That's a great place to start. All right, so this is going to be kind of crazy here. I'm going to show you an app that we put together that will kind of illustrate um, all of the things that I was just talking about. Setting up a region, 
um, ranging for beacons, monitoring for beacons. So let's see if I can get this going. Uh, so where are those beacons throughout the room? Awesome, cool. Okay, so if we can just keep them there, I'm gonna kinda like walk around and you know, try to get my app to do different things in the room here. So let's exit out of here. So I just bought this new app, it's called Reflector, and it's supposed to make it really easy to show your, your phone screen. Oh my gosh, look at that. That's incredible. All right, so this is what's on my phone right now. And here's the app, we call it Beacon Demo. Uh, I'm sure you could whip something together like this in a few days or less. Okay, so here's kind of the main, main screen, just kind of beacon demo. And what this thing does, as soon as you start up this app, it creates a region for, um, no, okay, so it starts up and it starts ranging for, or it starts monitoring for a region. And the region is the Estimote Beacon region. So it's looking around through this room, it's monitoring to enter a region that has Estimote unique identifiers. So just the first part, each of these beacons has three numbers associated with it. Right now this app is listening for just that first number. It's monitoring for that number. Well as soon as it says, hey, with a, I'm within 50 feet of one of these beacons, which it is right now, now it's starting to range once a second. So this thing's looking once a second. Um, let's, let's walk over here and let's see what it does. I feel like Donahue or something, <laughs> like Maury. All right, good, good. Okay, cool. Hey, the screen changed color, it's the same color as the beacon. It says, hey, redeem discount right here. Click this. Oh, snowman, 30% off. But it says Uncle Ben, oh, that's weird. I don't want that there. I'll show you how I'm gonna fix it later. Okay, let's walk over here. Try not to trigger it again. So where is this one? Oh, cool. Oh my God. There we go. Purple beacon, purple screen. Okay, gingerbread, 20% off. Okay, that one was right. So if it was asleep, it would, so if I turn off the screen really quick, right now it's only monitoring, and I'm not sending any code for monitoring right now. But it's, it's monitoring, it's trying to make sure. Now if I left this room and restarted the app, I do have some code for sending it kind of like a UI notification. So if I was a ways away and I just walked into this room, it would send me a little notification that would say, hey, welcome to the gingerbread store. That kind of thing. Yeah, let me get this. Oh, this reflector is awesome. Okay, last one. Walking towards the green one. All right, pine tree. Okay, so you saw up there, that one said Uncle Ben, snowman. Well, that's, that's wrong. We don't want that. Our, our client, their store, they don't want that. That's completely wrong. So in a real setting, it's like, how would you fix that? Because if you were hard coding that text into your app, you would need to go back into Xcode, you need to change that text, and you would need to resubmit it to the App Store, and let's say your client just says, hey, we need to do app updates fast. We, you know, we need to push this stuff out you know, within minutes or hours as opposed to weeks. So the way this app works is it interacts with a, a database that's online and it's using a tool called Parse. So basically how this works is, you know, as it's ranging for a beacon, it's getting all these beacons in its array and then it grabs the closest one and it goes, okay, well, the numbers for that beacon are, you know, some two long strings of numbers and it takes those numbers and it connects to our Parse database and then it pulls out the correct coupon data for that beacon. So, how many of you in here use Parse? You guys ever? Oh, it's just fantastic. I can't go on enough about it. It's, it's so cool. 
All right, so let me resize this ridiculous screen here. There we go, okay. So I'm going into something called the data browser and Parse is really cool because it's like a big Excel spreadsheet online and you can update it and when you update it in the browser here, you can see the updates in your code in seconds. So right now, I have four line items inside of this app. Because there's there are three beacons which are have these long major and minor numbers. And I see this one, the purple one has 2222. Two, two, two. That was the warm gingerbread. The one at the bottom was the pine tree. And we see this one for Uncle Ben. And that was the one that's wrong. So I think that that was a, I don't know, I think it was like a snowflake or something. So I just say snowflake. I just make the change. Let's run the app again. Let's walk up to that thing again and see if it makes a change here. Oh, well, it turned into a snowflake, so we know it worked. <laughs> but cool, but what, what this shows is, you know, if you're gonna be building iBeacon apps for your clients, you need a way so you can update what information is triggered inside of your app because your clients are gonna to wanna to be able to change that data very quickly and, and frequently. And I strongly recommend using Parse for this kind of thing. So when they come out of the box, the beacons are actually already active. The UUID, the first of the three numbers, is constant for all um, estimate beacons. Other companies change that number. It's constant, but then the major and minor values are random. You can read them, and um, if you know how, you can actually edit them as well. And more and more companies are providing tools for you to be able to edit the major and minor values um, just to increase safety precautions so nobody can kind of yeah, hack yeah. into your app network. It's kind of a hardware interface on the circuit board that you showed, showed us pictures of the contents of the beacons, so you maybe grab a couple tips there. And um, it, it's not that. Actually, these companies are coming up with different back-end tools that allow you to um, basically manage the content that each beacon has. So you actually do that over there as well? Yeah, okay. yep, yep. Which uh, introduces all sorts of interesting security concerns. Yeah. <laughs> but this is the first iteration of Estimote beacons and the people at Estimote would quickly say, yeah, you know, our beacons have this security flaw right now. They're updating their, their their hardware and their software around it to remove these security concerns, you know, in the near future. I, I think I've been told within, you know, a month. So, and that's just for that one manufacturer. There are a bunch of other manufacturers who already have the security tools in place so you can't edit and mess with a beacon network. There's one thing, one other thing I wanted to show you. So, let's see if I can bring up my iPad, I made my iPad a beacon. So I wanna show you how that works. Let's see, so I mentioned that GitHub project called High Beacons. And let me bring it up on my screen here. So yeah, if you download that, I have that app downloaded onto my machine right now. Let's do AirPlay. Cool. So high beacons is super simple. There we go. Okay, so there are basically two toggles. One says, I'm gonna range, I'm gonna search for beacons, and the other one is, I'm gonna advertise. And this one, I kinda 
dove into the code here, and I made my own advertising packet. So I said, let's open up Xcode here. But basically I said inside of, when this thing advertises, it's giving off a estimate UUID, the first number, and then it's giving a major and minor value equal to 1,000. And if you looked in that parse database I had, I had 1,000 being as generating a different, um, a different coupon. So this isn't scaling quite correctly, so I'm not going to dig you too deep into this, but let's see if I can show you. We'll skip that for now. But basically, when I advertise with this, my other app can talk with this one. So once I start advertising, if I got over here with that phone, I would detect a different coupon. So not only can you deploy beacon networks throughout you know, a store, a hospital, a business, you can also make a point of sale system act as a beacon. You can also make, you know, if the employees are car carrying around tablets with them, you can make their tablets beacons. And the possibilities are just truly endless. So I'm going to quickly wrap this up here. Uh, there are a couple of more apps that I want to show you that are not mine. They're um, a couple of popular ones. This one's really cool. This one's called Pickpocket. And if you download this onto your phone, it's kind of like a really cool game where you can pickpocket, you know, virtual money from people who are also inside of this app. So I have this app. Uh, my co-founder has this app. A lot of my friends have it. And any time our phones get near each other, Basically, it brings up an alert message and it says, hey, you can, you know, I can pickpocket Matt, uh, pickpocket this guy. And they don't have to be your friends either. It's just anyone using this app. So you could be on the bus and you could be you know, sitting next to a guy stealing his pickpocket money. So it, it's a really cool app. I think on a more practical way, I think that it, as a developer, it's safe and it, I think it's smart to be developing for iBeacon because Apple's kind of drinking their own Kool-Aid, and other companies are as well. Uh, big retailers like Apple, they've installed iBeacons in all 254 of their stores. And I don't know if you read this a little while ago, but Safeway just, um, I think they're doing iBeacons in something like 100 of their stores. So the technology, it's new, and it's already being adopted by big players. So I think the combination of those two really pre presents an awesome opportunity for everybody in this room to um, really hear their clients out and find a way to see if iBeacons can be of help. So with that, do you guys have any questions? Yeah. Uh, can you send and receive at the same time? Be listening and I believe so. Yes, so you can use the Bluetooth low energy platform to send more data than just the data that these beacons are sending. And that's when you walk into the world of um, wearable devices and stuff. Like a heart rate monitor, it's using Bluetooth low energy. It's sending a small packet of data, but it's sending more data than any one of these beacons is sending. It's sending heart rate information. So I think that the Bluetooth low energy platform opens the door for wearables, but also all sorts of really cool sensors that you could do too. You can deploy really cool sensor networks throughout you know, buildings or you know, maybe deploy some in the ocean. I've heard all sorts of crazy ideas that you can do with Bluetooth. But the little beacons themselves are kind of, they're limited. Yeah, I know that these Estimote beacons, they actually have a, a, some additional hardware that allows this specific brand to I think that it has a temperature sensor on them as well as an accelerometer. So there's a little bit more. And you know, if you guys had the right manufacturing connections or something, I'm sure um, there's a way to manufacture a beacon that has the right information that you want to display. I mean, the potential for creating new companies is incredible. Yeah? What's the uh, maximum range? In your demo, you had to get pretty close to you know, pick up an individual beacon. But across the room or even across the building, being, 
Correct. So it really depends on the signal strength of the beacon. Um, these beacons, the furthest away I can detect them is between like 50 and 100 feet. But when I make my iPad be a beacon, I can detect it like 150 feet away. And I think that has to do something with the battery and therefore the signal strength. So um, I'll, I'll go back a slide or two here that will really kind of show you. So for that app that I showed you, I was utilizing Here we go, okay. I was saying, okay, if I'm immediate, CL proximity immediate, then trigger the call to parse database and pull out the coupon. But I could have said near. And from what I've seen with my phone and those beacons, immediate is like zero, in, is like zero all the way up to about 12 inches, maybe 18 inches. Near is something like you know a few feet away, three feet away, and then far is something like, I don't know, up to 50 feet, up to kind of the limit. But, one second, but like I showed you here, you don't have to use what Apple provides you right out of the box. You can use the proximity and RSSI values to come up with your own brackets. So you could trigger the event within 25 feet. You don't have to follow what Apple provides you outside of the box. You could write a custom Bucket, yeah. How reliable was the proximity detection when you have overlapping ranges of beacons? It seems that from a hardware perspective that there are other variables besides the distance to the beacon, like the orientation of the antennas, for instance, or reflections in the room. Are there instances where the wrong beacon is declared the closest one? Absolutely. Anytime you start getting beacons close together, interesting things like that happen. And it's because of different materials in the room can reflect the Bluetooth signal in different ways. So um, that proximity value isn't entirely accurate. At the end of the day, it's still more accurate form of determining a person's location inside than ever before, but it's still not you know, this one-to-one you know, -one tracking feature. Right away when these things came out, people started saying, okay, well you have three beacons in the room. What happens when you walk inside of that triangle? You can do the math and you could say, okay, here's the proximity to this one, the proximity to that one, and that one. You can do some very simple triangle math to figure out what your location is. Unfortunately, because of different interferences, antennas being turned different ways, different signal strengths, you get an idea of where somebody is inside of that triangle, it just might not be that accurate. Oh yeah, my, from what I've heard, the biggest interference with Bluetooth is uh, you, like your hand, your body, is the biggest source of interference. You're, you're completely right. You're completely right. I mean, the body is like, what, 80% water or something like that? Water does an incredible job of interfering with the Bluetooth signal. So, you know, if I'm getting in the way of this, if I just lay down on this Estimo beacon, yeah, your phone's probably not going to get any signal from that beacon. Yeah. Um, I'm not entirely sure how to answer that. Um, I know that you can, you can use what Apple provides you out of the box, but then I think that you can more, if you feel comfortable with it, interpret the raw values that are coming out of that thing and try to make a more complex app. I, I don't know if I understood you correctly, though. Okay. Yeah. So I was checking out a nerdery webinar on emerging technology. And is it true that iBeacon is open source? So I, I think that the, 
there's a little bit of confusion with the term iBeacon, because you hear iBeacon and you think Apple, because it's the little eyes in front of it. Well, iBeacons can be anything, Android devices can be an I can detect iBeacons. iBeacons are being made by companies who have no association with Apple whatsoever. I think iBeacon is just kind of the Apple branded term that they slapped on this technology, Bluetooth low energy devices that broadcast here I am signals and it, it kind of muddles exactly what iBeacon is. Well, what is the support for Android right now? Yeah, so Android devices, as far as I've seen in the last few weeks, a certain number of Android devices can detect beacons, but I don't think that there are any currently that can act as beacons. So I think that there are 200 million iOS devices that can be beacons or detect beacons, but only 50 million Android devices that can detect beacons only. That being said, I, I think that's because uh, on the Android side of things, they, there was a heavy invest in, investment in the, uh, I think it's called NFC technology. It's kind of where you bump your phone against something to pay for it. And there were a lot of investment in that technology and Apple never jumped on that bandwagon. So there are all of these current in the market devices for Android that have the NFC built into them, but not the Bluetooth low energy built into them. That's going to change. Um, we're already hearing that um, new devices on the Android side of things are going to adopt this Bluetooth low energy and have a little receiver inside of them. I see what you mean. Um, right now, there is no central place where people, somebody has organized all the different beacons that are on the market. I think that if somebody wanted to whip something that, like that together, it would get a lot of traction online. Yeah? Yeah, I think that that's kind of the next step for this kind of stuff is if the price for a piece of hardware is quickly approaching zero, it means the adoption or the, the ease of distributing big networks of these things is very effective and uh, cost effective. It doesn't cost very much. So I think it's totally possible that big corporate networks could say, okay, we're just gonna deploy beacons all over the place and developers could kind of use that network to build apps on top of. I think you could even see, perhaps on the, the government side of things, government cities deploying big networks of beacons for their internal IT department to use for different ways as well. Um, I really have no idea. We're, we're starting to get really on the cutting edge of a cutting edge technology. Is there any API to discover uh, beacons in your vicinity that you don't have any prior association with or where you don't know if you have the UI yet? Absolutely. So Apple has sample code for finding all beacons that are nearby, and there are plenty of apps that are similar on GitHub. The High Beacons app searches for all and any beacons in the room. It would instantly detect all of these beacons that are in the room, even though I don't have anything programmed in the app that says, look for this specific UUID. Well, cool. Thanks a lot for all your questions. Um, feel free to grab me afterwards. And uh, are we going to go grab some beer afterwards? Yeah. Um, awesome. Awesome. Thank you. There's a